They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called Naval Legends. In this episode, the unsinkable Clevelands. One of the sites in Buffalo, New York State, is USS Little Rock, stationed at the local Naval Museum. It is the last remaining Cleveland-class light cruiser. Built in great numbers, these ships boasted good survivability and were considered the heaviest light cruisers in the history of the US Navy. In the 17th, 18th, and first half of the 19th century, a cruiser was not a ship type. It was just a light ship. It could be a frigate, a brig, a brigantine. Their mission was to disrupt enemy communication lines. What is a naval battle about? Somebody wins and somebody loses. Then you should make use of the victory accordingly, which means disrupting enemy communications. And these lines are all over the ocean, as enemy ships are crisscrossing here and there. So your cruiser should be crisscrossing here and there too. She would go to the north, go to the south, go to the west, go to the east. This is where the word cruise comes from. She makes crossings, chasing enemy ships. However, if there are ships that disrupt supply routes, then you need ships to perform counter operations. This led to the emergence of different cruiser types. Protected, light, first rank, second rank, all kinds of cruisers. As you see behind us is the uh, USS Little Rock. Uh, she's a light cruiser. Uh, the reason why they call it a light cruiser is because her tonnage. She, had, she weighed 12,000 tons, and also she had smaller size naval guns. She had six inch guns, vice, like a heavy cruiser, had eight inch guns. But she is the last Cleveland class cruiser that's in existence today. The first ship, whose name was given to the whole series, was laid down in summer 1940. Her displacement was much higher than the standard for light cruisers at the time. For this reason, the Cleveland-class ships are sometimes called heavy light cruisers. The Americans realized that their key opponents were across seas and oceans. Consequently, to disrupt enemy communications, you had to cross either the Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean. So they needed a big ship with a large displacement, high self-sustainability, and powerful armament. Key specifications of the Cleveland-class cruisers. Total displacement up to 14,300 tons. Length, 186 meters. Beam, 20 meters. Draft, 7.5 meters. Armament, primary armament. 12 Mark 16 guns in four turrets. Caliber, 152 millimeters. Dual purpose artillery. 12 Mark 12 guns. Caliber, 127 millimeters. Anti-aircraft artillery. Different ships of the series were equipped with up to 28 Bofors and up to 20 Orlick and Auto Cannons. Armor, armor belt and conning tower, up to 127 millimeters. Deck, 51 millimeters. Turrets, up to 165 millimeters. Air group, four float planes. Maximum speed, 32.5 knots. Cruising range, 11,000 nautical miles. Building the Cleveland-class cruisers was a challenge for U.S. industry. 30 ships were ordered before the United States joined World War II. And after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the dockyards received orders for 20 more cruisers. The cruiser was used to protect the battleship. Then, of course, after Pearl Harbor, uh, battleships they realized that battleships were not what we needed. We needed to move forward. And so the aircraft carrier became the center of the, the battle group. Like dropping a stone into a pond or a pool of water, and you see the ripples as it 
they move out. So you would have the center would be the aircraft carrier, the next thing out would be the cruisers, the next thing out would be the destroyers. Since the Cleveland-class cruisers were constructed during World War II, the U.S. Navy wanted to have them armed as heavily as possible. This guideline was set by President Roosevelt himself. Besides the primary armament, which consisted of powerful six-inch guns, the Clevelands also featured formidable anti-aircraft artillery. Twelve five-inch dual-purpose guns and up to 50 Bofors and Orlikan barrels could surround the ship with a wall of steel, and not a single enemy aircraft was able to breach it. When Cleveland was being designed, there were debates about whether it was reasonable to install guns of such close calibers six and five inches. Some people were saying the cruiser should have only six inches. Why do we need the five inches? Others insisted on having only five inch guns. On paper, five and six inches look virtually the same. But the point is that a six inch shell weighs twice as much as a five inch one. So it has a much greater impact on enemy ships, a much greater destructive force. The President's instructions were fulfilled with the utmost diligence. Virtually the whole deck was dotted with gun barrels. But the designers got so enthusiastic that the cruiser turned out to be over-equipped with armament. As a result, one of the key drawbacks of the Cleveland class is that it cannot be upgraded. You had to either disarm the ship completely or leave her the way she is. For example, when missile systems were installed on these ships after World War II, part of their guns, specifically the primary armament, were simply removed. Currently in her configuration now, she only has one triple six inch turret and one five inch gun. All the rest were removed. But she did keep her six inch gun. She actually has the only six inch gun left uh, in the world. However, Cleveland's above water hull became heavier and this affected her stability, an important parameter for ocean vessels. The ship's angle of list was limited to 23 degrees, which was a minor drawback for the project. It was compensated by the other seagoing qualities of the ship. Despite a lack of stability, the cruisers demonstrated superb survivability during the war. The key factor here was not the ship's design, but the excellent work of their damage control parties. The cruiser receives damage, even when it's critical, and in just a few seconds, everyone is running, taking measures, doing their job. And after some time, a ship that was going to sink in 15 minutes is back on an even keel. Her engines are running, and she is sailing again, sometimes even continuing to fight. A good example is cruiser Houston, which was severely damaged by an airdrop torpedo in October 1944. All her engine rooms were out of order. The ship took on 6,000 tons of water, almost half of her displacement, but remained sailing. Her team had saved her. The most interesting thing is that the first torpedo damaged the hull, and the whole engine room was filled with water. When the ship was being transported to the Hawaiian Islands, she got hit by another torpedo. As a result, having a displacement of 13,500 tons, Houston took in so much water that her displacement became almost 21,000 tons. In other words, she was completely filled with water, but she made it to the port. The Cleveland class was the most numerous series of light cruisers in U.S. history. A total of 27 ships were built. Every three or four months, new cruisers were commissioned and sent straight to the war. By 1943, the Americans seized the initiative in the Pacific Theater. The Japanese assumed the strategic defense. By that time, they had captured almost all islands in the Western Pacific, up to the coast of Australia.
United States launched an offensive on multiple islands with Japanese garrisons on them, ready to defend to the last breath. But the Americans were not going to capture them all. They applied the so-called island hopping strategy, capturing only the islands that were of strategic value for further offensives. The US did not seek to destroy all Japanese garrisons on the islands. It was more important to secure the right bridgehead, no matter whether an enemy force was there or not. The Battle of Bougainville went down in history as the first US offensive operation against Japan. The Bougainville campaign was part of this offensive, part of the island hopping strategy. It was actually a bit grotesque, because US forces were deployed on Bougainville in a place where there were no enemies. The Japanese were stationed on this island, but in a different part of it. So the Americans were deployed there, but didn't try to capture the whole island, only the part they needed. But the Japanese, from their standpoint, this was an unthinkable impudence. Deploying next to our base, where we have plenty of troops, plenty of ships, plenty of aircraft, right here, within a stone's throw. And what are they going to do? OK, they've deployed their forces here. They will probably attempt to capture the whole island. But they are not trying to capture the whole island. How can that be? Bougainville was immensely important for the United States as Japan's major air force and naval base, Rabaul, was just 400 kilometers northwest of it. Powerful forces on Rabaul were preparing to advance to the south and southeast. By that time, Tokyo was controlling almost the whole of Southeast Asia, half of China, and hundreds of islands in the Pacific Ocean, from Sakhalin and the Kurils in the north to the Solomon Islands in the south. The Japanese suddenly saw that the Americans were at their door next to their most powerful naval base. Something had to be done. Everything they had at hand, all cruisers and destroyers stationed at Rabaul at that moment, were sent to Bougainville. In the evening of November the 1st, 1943, an imposing Japanese squadron left for Bougainville. It consisted of heavy cruisers Miyoko and Peguro, light cruisers Agano and Sendai, six destroyers and five transport ships, carrying a thousand troops. The Japanese force was to land on the island and defeat the US Marines, who had just been deployed to the coast of the Empress Augusta Bay. As soon as the Japanese ships left Rabaul to counter the US landing, the Americans were aware of this. They took all their landing assets away from the coast, where the Japanese ships were expected to attack them. Instead, the Americans put forward their escort ships, four Cleveland-class light cruisers and six destroyers. The whole thing happened at night, and it was night when the naval battle took place, a classic naval battle of World War II. Late into the small hours, a column of Clevelands was moving along the coast of Bougainville. The US cruisers were in front of the Empress Augusta Bay, when at 2.30, their radars detected a Japanese squadron comprising six destroyers and four cruisers. The US force, led by Admiral Merrill, deployed into combat formation, and its destroyers attacked the enemy. At 2.46, the US destroyers made their first torpedo salvo, but the Japanese ships changed their course and the torpedoes launched by the Fletchers missed the targets. However, the maneuver broke the Japanese formation and sent it into disarray. This is when the Clevelands opened fire at cruiser Sendai. Primary armament shells severely damaged the Japanese ship. In this turmoil, heavy cruiser Miyoko ran into a friendly destroyer, cutting off part of her power. Having fired from their primary guns, the Japanese cruisers revealed themselves to the Clevelands, who immediately returned fire. The Japanese heavy cruisers suffered a defeat and retreated under the cover of darkness. The Clevelands came out of this night battle as decidedly victorious.
But the Japanese did not give up. In the morning, they sent their ground-based aircraft to attack the Clevelands. And here, Cleveland-class cruisers demonstrated that they not only had excellent artillery to defeat similar surface ships, but also boasted superb anti-aircraft armament. They virtually engulfed the sky with fire, and the Japanese aircraft were unable to do anything, not even break through to the ships. Having repelled the Japanese aircraft, the U.S. forces approached Rabaul and delivered an airstrike. Basically, the Americans fulfilled their mission. At the same time, the Japanese garrison on Bougainville proved to be as firm as samurai. They stood till the end, till August 1945. They started breeding cows and growing vegetables there, because no more supplies were coming from their home country. They were surrounded. The Philippines had been liberated from Japan, and so forth, but the Japanese garrison stood. It stood till the end. The Bougainville campaign wouldn't have been considered daring, but reckless and silly, if the Clevelands hadn't won that battle. In fact, these ships led America to victory in this war. Capturing part of Bougainville was a key step on the way to neutralizing Japan's major base, Rabaul. And neutralizing Rabaul was an important step towards other islands, towards Japan itself, towards victory in the war. The Cleveland-class light cruisers went through the Pacific War with flying colors. Some of them were seriously damaged in battle, but none were sunk. Battered and burnt, Cleveland successfully repelled air raids, sank Japanese ships, and shelled enemy positions on countless islands. Apart from the 27 cruisers, the hulls of the Cleveland-class ships were used to build nine light aircraft carriers of the Independence class which had a significant impact on the outcome of World War II. In the post-war period, some Clevelands were equipped with cruise missiles and stayed in service in the U.S. Navy in a new capacity. When you read about the history of the Cleveland-class cruisers, it may seem like they didn't do anything special during World War II. Some battles, some operations, some damage. There's no glory. But the real war is about hard labor hard everyday labor, and the Clevelands were the ones who took it upon themselves. It's the best light cruiser project of the United States. They were everywhere. Look at any more or less significant battle of the war. Clevelands were there. They were the real workhorses of the U.S. Navy. USS Little Rock is the last remaining ship of her class. She served as a missile cruiser until the summer of 1977, when she was decommissioned. Today, the former squadron flagship is a museum in Buffalo, and her menacing appearance embodies the pride and glory of all Clevelands. <laughs>